I'm so thankful to be able to be here in Southern California. I love California. There's only, you know, there's only so many times a year I get to be here, and I thank God for each and every time that I get to know that I'm coming back to California to preach again. I thank God tonight, on Thursday night, that we're gathered here in such great numbers to shout the house down for Jesus. We're not worried about that which we had when we came through the door. We're not worried about that which we had when we left home. We're not worried about all the problems that we know are outside waiting on us. We're worried about being here tonight, being able to stand right here, being able to be right here, being able to shout right here, being able to do all that God has told us to do right here tonight inside this building. I thank God your bishop reached out to me and he said, Evangelist Steve, our gathering is this this time of the year. I want you to come out. I want you to preach not one, not two, not three, not four, but five nights. I want you to have your will and come out and you know what I thank God Bishop you brought me here I don't want nobody to leave the platform I don't want no instruments left alone I want all the musicians to stay where you're at I want the choir to stay where they're at I'm not a long-winded preacher I'm wide open at 110 if you're in my way get out I'm just trying to serve Jesus and get to where he told me to be before I can't do this no more but I don't want nobody to leave the platform if you're a pastor from another church and you've came here to be a part of this I want you to stay right where you're at I don't want you to move I want you to stay let me say it again right where you're at if you're somebody that this bishop and sister bishop brought here to help with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost I want you to stay right here where you're at it's not that I need a bunch of people around me I'm just doing exactly that which God told me to do I don't want nobody to leave the platform listen to me tonight church Listen to me tonight. I want you to know something. I'm proud tonight that I brought the whole rock solid team with me. I'm proud tonight. Everybody that has a part of my ministry that God gave me got on an airplane with me and we all flew out here. Why? Because they've never all been with me at one time, but I got all 10 of them with me tonight. I took up half the airplane from Denver over to LAX and it was all for Jesus. I thank Thank God for each and one of these people you see standing to my left. Without them, I could not do what I get to do every single day. I thank God for that. I heard them the other day talking in the office. And they were talking about how fun it must be to get on a plane every Thursday and fly out and fly back and fly out and fly back. And, and, and I heard one of them say, you have no idea the strain it puts on him. So I stuck my head into the office at the studios and I said, you know what, you're all going, clear your calendars, this is your vacation week, you're all going. You want to take your husbands, you want to take your wives, you want to take your children, that's fine. Everybody's getting on that plane and we're all going to California and we're going to show them how rock solid does it. So I'm thankful tonight. They've been standing back there at the table and they've been, they, they get to see what this ministry actually does. And I'm thankful for that. We've been out here since Monday. It's Thursday. We've had a good time. Some of them have went up and been at Disney World. Some of them at Disneyland. I'm sorry. I'm from Florida. Y'all got to understand that. It's Disney World. Y'all don't matter out here. But they've, they've got to do and see so many things that they've only heard about. They only get to see pictures of when my boys come with me or I snap off a car. I don't like photos. Y'all know that. Anybody that's been around me long enough knows I, I don't like pictures. <coughs> But I'm so thankful that God afforded me the ability to be able to bring the whole team out here. The whole team. Because now they get to see that their work is not in vain. When they answer the phones and they answer the emails and there's prayer request after prayer request coming in and they don't know which way to turn and Brother Steve's off somewhere else preaching again and there's a big problem that's come up, they get to see the end result of all that aggravation and stress that they go through here on this earth because somebody's getting saved, somebody's getting healed, somebody's getting filled, somebody's getting delivered. You know, for the last couple hours I've been walking around and I was out front before they even opened the doors tonight and, and, and I walked all the way up and down the line of people and, and then when they got inside they kept seeing me but they weren't seeing me and, and I know y'all think I'm out of my mind but I'm so proud that my son Anthony is with me tonight. 
I haven't seen him in a very long time, but he called me and he said, Dad, I'm coming home. And I said, coming home? You can't come home. I'm not going to be home. And he said, well, where are you going to be? And I said, I got to go to California. He said, that's fine. I'll fly into Houston. I'll get to hear you preach in Houston and then I'll fly up to Denver with you and I'll get to hear you preach there and then we'll go out to California. And my son is with me tonight and I'm thankful for that. He's not me. Everybody keeps saying, Brother Steve's taking pictures. Brother Steve ain't taking pictures. That's Brother Anthony, my, my, my boy. He's right, up, he's right up there in the balcony right now taking more pictures. He got him a new camera the other day in, in Denver and I guess he's some kind of a semi-amateur photographer he loves to take pictures and he's seen the camera and he said dad I really want that camera and I said well go ahead and get it if you want it and he bought it and I, I promise you that shutter button on that thing has been clicking non-stop sometimes I think he's taking pictures just to take pictures but brother Steve is, does, does not have a twin and there's people out there in this world today saying thank God there's only one of them we couldn't handle two ten people are sitting right there the whole rock solid stair sitting on the front row saying thank God there's only one of them but I'm so thankful my son got to get on an airplane with me and fly out here with not just me, but the whole group met us in San Diego when we all came down here together. I thank God for that. I thank God for that. Huh? This is my family. This is the only family that I have right here is my church family. But I thank God that my son is with me and he's taken hundreds and hundreds of pictures and he's going to take them back to Hawaii where he lives and works and he's going to, you know, somebody's going to see those pictures and say, <coughs> what is it your dad does? Well, he's an evangelist. He goes all over preaching Jesus. And it might just be the little seed that lets them in that they got to hear more of what Anthony's dad does. It's not Anthony's dad that does anything. It's the anointing of the Holy Ghost that God placed in my life to preach this undeniable, undefinable word of God, which is no other than a five-lettered word than J-E-S-U-S. I thank God for that tonight. I said, I thank God for that tonight. If you ain't thankful for nothing, why don't you just be thankful that I got to bring my son out to California and he can hear his dad preach the gospel of Jesus. He met me backstage a while ago before he walked. He's in his suit too. Can you all give him a round of applause? He went and even bought himself a brand new suit to wear here tonight. But he came back and he said, Dad, the place is packed. And I said, yes, yeah, so? He said, well, I hope you brought your A game. I said, nah, I left it at home. I got my J game. My Jesus game is in my pocket, and we're going to be okay. I thank God that my son is with me. I don't get caught up into the things of the world a lot. But when you get to look off across an airport corridor or inside a church, and you get to see one of your children that, that you help bring into this world, and they're with you, promoting the gospel. He has stood at the table and he has smiled and he said, no, I'm, I'm just his son. I thank God for that. But as I said, I don't want nobody to move and I'm going to show you why in a minute. Up here on this platform. But I want you to do something for me right real quick. Like, <laughs> I, want, I want you to understand something. Everywhere I go, I preach about this church. This church. This church has more of a desire to serve the Lord in its fullness than I think I get to witness anywhere else. Not that none of the rest of them don't, but my Lord, this church knows how to shout. This church knows how to break down all the walls that the devil tries to put in front of us as Christian. This church knows if they just come through that back door, shout, and they'll go out the front door and things won't be the same because they'll have joy, peace, and hope and love everlasting in their lives and the devil's gonna come again. As soon as they hit them streets, as soon as they hit them neighborhoods, they know that same devil that they've been running off half their life uh, is still going to be standing there. But they were in church tonight uh, and they were shouting. I'm thankful for that. I said, I'm thankful for that. I said, I'm thankful for that. 
You guys have all heard me preach enough. You know you're not going to sit down like you're at home and you're lazy boy with your gallon of milk and your box of Twinkies or or hostess cakes or whatever you eat. You, I want everybody in this building <clears throat> where my son's at up there in the balcony all the way down here to the front. I want you to stand up. You know what amazes me about this church is from the moment I walked out here, the young people, the middle-aged people, they started making their way to the front. Look around you. There's a lot of open seats right now but they're right up here in the front Uh, all these people have came to the front uh, and they've gathered up here around the front Uh, you know what Uh, that sets my soul afire it lets me know uh, that there's still somewhere in this world uh, where people are expecting to hear from God uh, and they're not going to stand at the back Uh, they're not going to wait for somebody to pass them Uh, they're going to get up here to the front uh, and they're going to listen to what God's got to say (coughs) You have to excuse me, I'm coming over a bad cold. I'm an asthmatic by birth, and I battle my asthma severely sometimes. But I thank God that you see everybody standing up. As you all just saw, I was coming out. Bishop Bruss bringing me out. And you just seen this young, come here. You just seen this young lady, she's 27 years old. She just come running up to me. She, she pushed the usher out the way. She stiffed arm this man right here and she said, I gotta get to him. And, and she come running up them stairs. And I seen her and, and you know, sometimes it kind of scares you when somebody's coming at you wide open. But the Lord told me, stop and listen. And I put my hand up and I stopped and said, no, let her come over. And I backed up and thank you, Bishop, for singing that song again over and over and over. But she had a story to tell me and I wanted to hear it. She said, Evangelist, I cannot begin to tell you what God has done for me. And I said, well, as quickly as you can, can you tell me? And she said, this time, a year and six months ago, I think she said, correct me if I'm wrong, a year and six months, right? Yeah. She said, I was a full-blown addict, homeless and living on the street, prostituting my body, trying to get the next dollar so I could get high again. And I looked at it and I said, you don't look like a prostitute no more. You don't look like you're homeless no more. You don't look like you need food anymore. You look like you're healthy and vibrant. What happened? She said, Jesus saved my soul. Whoa, somebody didn't hear me. Because if you had heard me, the foundations of this very building would be shaken. She said, Jesus saved my soul. And I said, tell me how Jesus saved your soul. And she looked back at me and she goes, you know, it's kind of a funny story, but you'll like it because I listen to everything you say and do and, and mom's on your account and you send CDs and all that. And, I, and, and when mom's done with them, she gives them to me. And I stopped her. I said, where's your mom? And she pointed right down here. You too. Come here, ma'am. Her mom come up. We're not much difference in age, me and her mom. And I said, wow, this is a story. Isn't it? And I said, mom, tell me what happened. And she said, evangelist. My daughter would break into my house once a month. Once a month, I could set my clock to it. She would come along and bust the window, pick the lock. It didn't matter what kind of alarm system we had. For five years, my daughter's been breaking into my house once a month. And she said, so I got tired of my daughter taking what she wanted. And I prayed and the Lord told me to put a little box together (coughs) and put the things inside that box that are going to help her. And I said, well, ma'am, what'd you put in the box? And she said, well, of course, I put a few dollars. Even though I knew where the dollars were going to go, I put a few dollars. And I put some tuna fish, and I put some crackers, and I put some good underclothes. <coughs> and I put some, uh, some drinks, and, and, and she, she rattled it off. She said, but I put one, what? She said, about a year and a half ago, I put one of your CD packs in the box. And I smiled, and I said, no, you did not. And she said, yes, I did. And I said, well, you got to have a CD player to play the CD, and they don't really make those things anymore. And she said, but I had in my garage an old portable CD player, a Walkman, as it was in my day. I know I'm old. And she said, a Walkman? She goes, you know what? I just throwed a pack of AA batteries in here. I threw the Walkman in here. I went down to the store and bought some earphones for it, and I throwed your CD in there. Are you going to change? And I looked back at 
at the daughter and I said, now you, you, you broke into mom's house and mom conveniently set you up to steal the box like she's been doing for over a year and a half. You stole the box, what'd you do? She said, you know, evangelist, I, I, I took the money out. I took and changed my clothes. I took a shower at my mom's and I almost walked out and left that box. But something stopped me and I picked it up. I went and got in the car with the man and we drove off. And I said, where'd you drive to? She said, we drove down to San Bernardino. And she said she was sleeping on the streets. And one night she didn't have nothing to do. She's high as a kite, she said. She's standing right here. I'm not telling you anything she didn't tell me. And I made sure she knew I was going to tell you all about it. Because it goes right in line with what God gave me to give this church this week. <clears throat> Listen to me. She said it was late. They were sleeping in the car. It was cold. A lot of people don't understand, but it gets cold out here in California in certain places at night. She said it got real cold. She was fiddling around in that box, and she come across the Walkman. She come across the batteries. She come across the headphone, and then she come across the CD. Are you gonna change? Are you gonna change? And she said she tore it open and she put it in, and she started listening, and she got to the end of it. And she got out that car and she slammed the door and she said, I'm not living like this no more. I'm going home. I'm going to where I got a clean place to sleep. And I'm going to where my mama loves me and my dad loves me and my brothers and sisters are waiting on me to come home. I'm going to change. She started walking. She got within a mile and a cop picked her up and took her all the way home. They got her in rehab and she's been clean. Somebody put Put your hands together. Somebody shout. She's been clean for 16 months of her life. She ain't looked at the devil. She ain't touched the devil. She ain't been nowhere near the devil. Whoa, somebody needs to shout. Somebody needs to dance. Somebody needs to run. Somebody needs to say, Jesus, I love you for that which you've done. This young lady is clean. I could preach all night on that. And I promise you to this much, you're going to call the office and you're going to speak to her and she's going to get your testimony on tape and it's going all across this world. But I don't care. I told y'all don't sit down. As you can see, this church has made its way to the front. There's literally three, 400 people standing up here at front tonight. We're going to shout the house down for no other reason. My Jesus reached down in the middle of the night in a drug infested neighborhood in San Bernardino, California. And he pulled one little girl out. And now she's standing in church. And she's shouting. She's got a job. She's got a car. She's got a smile. She's got a Jesus in her heart. All the thousands and thousands of miles I travel. (laughs) Those stories make it worthwhile. Listen to me, church. I want to know something tonight. I want to know if you're tired of that devil taking our children. I want to know if you're tired of that devil coming in and taking our families. I want to know if you're tired of that devil coming in and telling us you can't read the Bible no more. Matter of fact, we're going to take it out your state. I want to know tonight if you're tired of that devil coming in and telling you every single thing you're going to do and you're not going to do. And if you listen to him real closely, most of it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. we fell so far from the grace of God in the last 50 years of this country. We're not under God no more. He's off to the side standing somewhere and we're watching. I want to know tonight, are you tired? Are you sick? Are you tired of losing everything in your life? Are you tired of backing up and surrendering? Are you tired of sitting at the back? Well, I got news for you. I'm saved, water baptized, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, running for my life. And I ain't sitting at the back no more. No, I'm going to be like all these young kids, these 10, 11, 12, 14 year old kids standing up front tonight. I'm getting to the front. You see, I didn't have to tell them to get off the instruments. They already run into the front. I want you to look. The choir's coming to the front. Your bishops are coming to the front. The pastors are coming to the front. I'm tired of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the church of Buddha. I'm not church talking about the church of Islam. I'm not talking about Ari Krishna. I'm not talking about the Jehovah Witness. I'm not talking about anything other than a tongue-talking, blood-bought, crimson-red, saved by the grace of Jesus. 
Jesus Christ church uh, that is tired, tired, tired of being stepped on and walked on by that devil. I want to know tonight, uh, are you going to stand up? Are you going to stand up? Are you going to stand up? Are you going to stand up and look at that devil and say, I ain't going to take it no more. I'm not going to take it no more. When I was a little kid in my father's tent in Wilmington, Delaware, he had this guy that stood six foot six. His name was Richard Appendeck. And he'd get all wound up and he'd say, I ain't going to, I'm all fired up and I ain't going to take it no more. I want to know tonight, are you all fired up? But are you standing up? I'm fast preacher, y'all know that. I'll be done and you'll be eating a Big Mac topping off your stomachs before you even know I was preaching. You see, this little girl got tired. She got wore out with what the devil was telling her she had to do. And I've said this a million times over, the strongest person in the world is a person that's fed up with being told what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and how they're going to do it, because they're going to rebel. I live in the greatest nation under God. God created this whole world, this universe, Mars, Jupiter, all that he created. I don't, I don't care, but I, I know I'm in California. And y'all got the tree huggers and the big bang theories. But God created this world. My uncle ain't no chimp. And my mother ain't no chimpanzee. And my daddy sure was not some silverback gorilla. My father was a human being that God birthed into existence when he created man. Make no mistake in my words tonight. Listen to me. Are you tired? If you, if you study history, all through history, I don't care, pick a country. Russia, Israel, Egypt. Somewhere in that country's history, somewhere in that mankind's history, they got tired of taking it. They got tired of being told what they were going to do and what they weren't going to do. You know what? We as a country got like that too. And we told the king, we ain't going to take it no more. You can come over here. You can shoot us. You can bomb us. You can take all our land and all that, but we ain't going to listen to you no more. And in Boston, they had a tea party. Y'all know history I don't have to go through this and we stood up to that king and we became the United States of America under God so when people are oppressed and they're pushed down and there's nowhere to turn left or right and the world and the weight and the labor has become so great you know what they do they stand up for that which they're told and that's all I'm simply asking tonight are you gonna stand up are you gonna stand up are you gonna stand up if you're tired of that devil as I said before taking your children taking your loved ones taking your family and ruin their lives aren't you gonna stand up tonight and say no more devil get away from me Jesus has saved me and I might have to slip this CD of some crazy lunatic preaching psycho from Philadelphia Pennsylvania and Wilmington Delaware and put it in my daughter's box but I got faith in God she's going to hear him preach and she's going to change let me tell you something all through history Men have stood up for what's right. And the course of it, that country has changed. Let me take you back in time to 1913. A little girl was born in Tuskegee, Alabama. And she was a black little girl. And she was born into hard times. But she grew up hard. And she grew up always knowing things were going to be different in her lifetime. And you know what? She grew up fast because by the time she was 11, she was caring for her terminally ill grandmother. And then after she got through that, her mom developed a terminally disease. And then after she got through that, she had to move to Montgomery, Alabama, where I was born, by the way. And I am a proud Alabama person. I, I will say roll tide till the day I die. Roll tide. That, I got you all. But you know what I want you to think about? Listen to me. That young little girl at 19 years old, she found herself in Montgomery, Alabama. And if you studied history in the civil rights, and I'm not a civil rights preacher, 
but I am a Jesus preacher. And when somebody's taking all the, 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 the stuff the devil's dishing at them and they get tired, they don't really care what the devil's going to do to them next. And in my opinion, in my honest, honest, Holy Ghost filled opinion, that's the most dangerous Christian to deal with because you've backed him in a corner and he's going to come out not swinging left and right, but he's going to come out saying, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, get behind me, Satan. She was 19 years old, and she just, she just was living in Montgomery, Alabama. And you all know who I'm talking about. If you don't, I'm going to give it to you, Rosa Parks. One day she was tired. One day she was, she was fed up. One day she was aggravated that she just walked through five or six blocks, they say. And, and, and she got to her bus stop, and there was no seat in the back of the bus, but the front of the bus was open. Think about the, the world that we lived in at that time. They had to use their own separate bathrooms. They had to eat in a separate place. They were treated like common trash. But there was just one person, just like this mother I've kept right beside me and this daughter I've kept right beside me. There was just that one person that said I'm fed up with it and I ain't going to take it no more. And today I'm going to make my stand. Today I'm going to make my stand. I've been going to church. I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible. And I am persuaded that he is able. Yea, though a thousand enemy come against me, I'm going to stand up for what Jesus told me. And he told me I ain't got to sit at the back of the bus. I can sit at the front of the bus she reached down in her purse she paid her money and the bus driver already didn't like her if you study the story well enough she looked around and she seen one empty seat and she walked right to it and she sat down there were white people still standing up but she sat down the bus driver came over to her and said ma'am you can't do that you need to get up and let us sit down and she didn't say a word they pulled her off the bus. They arrested her. But that one act of defiance, that one act of standing up, changed the course of this nation. It is a nation that has all the rights. It is a nation that's created equal. No matter what your skin color is, no matter what your race is, no matter what language you talk, no matter where you came from, if you're an American citizen, you have the rights of everybody else. Because of that one lady that got tired of being told, I'm not going to the back of the bus no more. I'm sitting at the front. Well, you know what I wait for as a Christian? You know what I wait for as a preacher? You know what I wait for as an evangelist? You know what I wait for every single day of my life? I don't watch TV. I watch the news from time to time. And I keep saying, when is the church going to get fed up and come from the back of the bus to the front of the bus and stand up on that? which God has told them uh, when when will that happen when will we stop saying devil it's okay we don't need to pray in school devil it's okay we can have an abortion devil it's okay we can have the morning after pill and we can do all we want the day before when are we going to stop saying it's okay they can be nine months pregnant we'll still terminate that baby like they're doing in New York when will we stop saying it's okay and when will we stand Upon that which, upon that which, upon that which that God told us to stand on, that God told us to stand on. Because when that happens, that's when this country, this church, this nation will become great again. You can vote him in 20 more times. I don't care until we, the church, Rise up together and stand one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Listen to me. One nation under God, not one nation under Muhammad, not one nation under Hari Ra 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 Krishna, one nation under God. Let me explain something to you, though. She might have been a young lady, 20-something years old, but God put her in the right place at the right time to be taught how to stand up. What do you mean, evangelist? You're getting deep now. Yeah, I am getting deep because when I studied her, I was fascinated by one thing and one thing alone. The church that she went to in Montgomery, and I've, 
I've, I've, I've drove by where that church is, and I've walked that same path that they all walked in Montgomery. The church that she went to was called Hope. <laughs> and it was 95% black African American people that attended that church. But there was one thing that stood out different from that church. Her pastor was a white boy. Somebody tell me God ain't real. Her pastor was somebody that God told to go to Montgomery and preach Jesus. And somebody's going to hear you and it'll change this nation. He was a white man with his wife and children. And he walked into that church every Sunday, every Wednesday. And he preached and he preached and he preached and he preached and he preached. And, he preached, and would it come time for Sister Rosa Parks to stand up and say I'm all fired up and I ain't taking it no more today's the day I'm sitting at the front of the bus she had the knowledge because of her preacher to know that God was on her side if you got your Bibles I want you to turn with me listen to me I know you're all standing up and we're wound up and I'm gonna I'm, I'm telling you we're going to get turned loose in a second. Don't worry about that. But I got to get this a point to you before I let us all go crazy. I want you to open your Bibles if you can. If not, you know I'm going to quote it to you. People always say to me, Evangelist, what do you do? Sit around and read the Bible all the time? If, if I could get away with it, I honestly, I think I honestly would because I love the Word of God. There's not one problem that you have that Jesus will not answer in those books of the Bible and give you the answer to your problem. But I want you to turn with me to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 13th verse. And I want you to listen to me, quote it to you. Because if ever there was a time that we needed this one verse in the Bible, it's today. You see, she's been clean for a year and a half, but she's only been clean in a year and a half because every day she devotes herself back to God. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brethren, present yourselves a living sacrifice. The word sacrifice, every day you're going to sacrifice yourself. And even though you might want to get high that she was doing that, and you might want to go turn a trick to make the money to get high, she's going to sacrifice herself and say, I'm not doing it no more so that she can help three or four other girls that were in the same position she was in come out from amongst them. <laughs> I'll get sidetracked on that one. Ephesians 6, 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand, withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. If I didn't quote it exactly right, don't get mad at me. I just, I just hear the words and I speak them. What did it say? It says, Wherefore. Take unto you the whole armor. The whole armor. This little mom, she had on the whole armor. That's how God could speak to her and say, listen to me. Slip that CD in there. Put the batteries in there. Put the CD player in there. I'm quite sure she said, well, God, you know what she's just going to do. Huh? She's going to go down to the pawn shop and pawn it for $5 and go get her a bump of crack rock. And you know what? But she didn't say that. She said, okay, Lord, show me which CD. And she got to digging through there and God said, that one, that one, that one, that one right there. That one right there. Are you changing? Are are you going to change? Are you going to start over? Are you going to do it right? I remember that message like it was yesterday and I ain't preached it in over three years. But listen to me closely. God spoke to her. Why? Because she was going to church. She was paying her tithes. She was reading her Bible. She was standing up for Jesus and God spoke to her. Are you standing? I promise you this much. You can come into church every night like we are here tonight. And we can shout the house down. We're going to do it tomorrow night, Saturday night, Sunday night. I promise you that. 
But when you walk back out that door, that devil's still standing right there. And he's right in your face. And if you ain't put on the whole armor of God, if you ain't praying, if you ain't reading, if you ain't calling forth those things that be not as though they were, that devil's going to whoop you time and time again. But when you put on the whole armor of God and you got your best armor on, you know what? That devil can come at you ten ways to Sunday and you'll be able to repel the fiery darts that he's throwing at you. What does that mean, evangelist? When when your son won't listen to you huh? and he's smoking dope huh? and he's running around huh? and he's involved with people you know that are going to lead him down a dark road huh? that devil will not deter you from that which you're doing huh? when your daughter's going crazy get locked up won't call you won't speak to you won't do nothing huh? let me tell you something they don't need to talk to us because huh? God's talking to them huh? because we got on the whole armor of God huh? and no matter what they do huh? no matter what they say huh? no matter where they go huh? that armor is going to protect us I'm not a deep preacher y'all know that I don't spit out 500 verses a night. I give you one, maybe two, and I let God take that home with you. But I promise you this much. Wherefore, put on the whole armor of God. You don't put on that armor on Sunday and take it off on Monday and go to work and act like one of the boys. Let me tell you what acting like one of the boys is. It's called social media. You get on there on Sunday and you claim, oh, Hosanna, Hosanna be the name. Blessed be the name. However that old song goes. That's not putting on the armor of God. You don't get on social media and say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. God told me. And then the very next day, you're sitting at a birthday party with your Corona, with the lime in the top, and you're saying, ladies, night out. Or you're saying, the boys is getting together. That's not putting on the full armor of God. And you can get mad at me if half of you are doing it. I don't care. The door's back there, and there's a big sign on it that says exit. The church has got too many people playing social media Christian, and not enough people standing up here tonight shouting the house down because somebody gave their heart to God Anthony son you're close to me come up here and get your dad's necklace it fell off listen to me church listen to me church listen to me church that's not putting on the full armor of God going on Facebook and saying oh the Lord done done so much for me but I think I'm going to head on down to the creek and get drunk that's not that's not putting on the whole armor of God. That's you picking and choosing what piece of the armor you're going to wear. And believe it or not, that don't work. That don't work. I said that don't work. And that's why this country is in the mess that it's in today. We got churches on every corner. We don't just got churches. We got churches that hold 40,000 people sitting in some cities. But yet sin could fill up that church 50 times over any day of the week. Why? Because you got parcel armor of God on and that's why when the devil comes at you, you don't know which way to turn. And most of the time, you just throw your hands up. Well, listen to me closely. There's a generation behind us watching. And God have mercy on our souls if we just throw our hands up because they're watching. And we got too many, too many Facebook preachers. We got too many Facebook evangelists. We got too many social media this and social media that. And we got too many of people calling themselves prophets and prophetess and this and that. When all we simply need is a group of people like we see here tonight gathered together under one name, under one salvation. And we're screaming to the highest. Jesus can only change. Let me explain something to you. That little lady got on the front of that bus and she sat down and it took Montgomery's finest to pull her off and get her out. But what did she do? She started what they called a bo bus boycott. And I don't care what the other one's done. I don't care what name you want to put with the civil rights movement. I'm not going to get in trouble and get sued because I said a name. I'm going to tell you this much. That little lady full of God started the civil rights movement and it changed from that day forward. Why? Because people could 
see she wasn't going to take it no more. People could see she wasn't going to be treated that way no more. You know what? She lived in 2005 and all the way to the end. She said, thank God I made it. Thank God I made a stand. I want to know tonight, are you standing up? Are you standing up? Are you standing up? Are you standing up? I want to tonight, are you going to keep standing up for God? Or are you going to sit down and let everybody walk on top of you and tell you, you don't have to pray like that no more. You don't have to read your Bible like that no more. You don't have to do those things no more. I'm here to tell you, you do have to do those things. Let me give you one more scripture. I'm almost done. I'm fixing to close. Don't go nowhere. I'm fixing to close. And I promise you, if I got to stay here all night, I'm going to pray for every. I got a lot of help up here. As you can see, I got 20, 30 preachers standing behind me. And I got thousands of preachers on the internet that are going to help me pray for every single person standing up here that wants prayer. Psalms. 118 it's a verse myself personally I say to myself every single day when I'm tired when my asthma's bothering me my kids are going nuts I ain't talked to them in months and months and months and I got everybody wanting to get a part of me and it just seems I can't find one quiet place to sit down this is the voice I say this is the verse I say Psalms 118 and 14 says the battle is not yours it's the Lord's. That's all I'm going to say at first. The battle is not yours. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me and understand me. And I'm going to close with this. If you're not up here, start making your way up front. If you're not up here, start making your way up front. I told you, there's probably 60 preachers on this platform. Ain't no devil going to stand up to 61 counting me. There's probably 60 wives of 60 preachers up here. There ain't no devil going to stand up to them. My mama was a preacher's wife her whole life and still is to this day. And I promise you, one anointed woman can run off twice as many devils as any anybody else listen to me closely the battle is not yours you see mama finally gave up and she started listening to God and she started putting something in a box and she started putting scriptures and a Bible here and a Bible there and she gave up on the battle and she said Lord it's my daughter and I love her and I know you're going to save her and bring her home I'm not giving up on the battle but I'm giving it to you and look tonight Look tonight, I've kept her right by my side. I've kept her mom and her daughter right by my side. Right by my side. Right here. Why? Because I'm telling you tonight, church, when we stand up, and the Bible says when you've done all you can do, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord thy God. For this enemy that you see today, you will not see no more. That's an exodus. Listen to me. But you got to stand. you got to stand. you got to stand. you got to plant your feet. you got to stand. And and now the team that came out here with me, all of Rock Solid Ministries, all 10 of them, they're here with me tonight and they're shouting and they're dancing because they know now why I'm relentless in my pursuit to just stand for one name and that's Jesus. I don't care what the rest of this world does. I don't care what you call yourself. I don't care if you stand on Facebook on Monday and drink on Tuesday. I care that Rock Solid Ministries is standing is standing, is standing, is standing, is standing for Jesus. I want you to get up and I want you to come to the front. If you're not already here, get here. Don't worry about the people taking pictures. We're not worried about no photographs. We're worried about what Jesus sees us doing. Tonight, this week in California, we're going to stand for God. We're going to stand for God. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you is my prayer.